Usually when there's some sort of critical system vulnerability, you'd expect it to be somewhat complex. Not something you would see just briefly looking over the code. Maybe something like a buffer overflow that only occurs with a specific string under a specific set of hardware configuration. But not today, because a developer on GitLab made a mistake that any developer can make and any developer could spot. This is CVE 2022-1162. A hard-coded password was set for accounts registered using an OmniAuth provider. So this is through OAuth, LDAP, or SAML. Basically, a secure means of accessing a server commonly used for doing account sign-up, account authentication, and things like that. I'll say that again. A hard-coded password was set. In case you're curious, this is the password. So this string of characters and then a set number of zeros after it. Unlike many mistakes out there, it's not hard to explain what the problem is here. Passwords should never be hard coded. That's a terrible idea, but I know I've made this mistake myself back when I was in uni and like my first year projects. So I'm not saying this can't happen, just it shouldn't happen. Now this wasn't just affecting one version of GitLab, it was affecting both the community edition, the free version that anybody can go and host, along with the enterprise edition, the paid version used by many corporations out there. For versions 14.7 prior to 14.7.7, 14.8 prior to 14.8.5, prior to 14.8.5, and 14.9 prior to 14.9.2. And those version numbers are the same on both versions of the application. On the bright side, the earliest affected versions only go back to January of this year. So anything on the 14.6 series, 14.5, so on and so forth, those versions are completely unaffected. Now you might be thinking, why in the first place are we trying to set a password in code? Shouldn't the password be set by the user and then it just accepts that input? Well, you've probably seen a service where you sign up for it and then you're emailed a default password. GitLab is basically doing the same thing here. The problem is though, is those services go and pseudo generate that password. So theoretically, every single one of those passwords is going to be different. In this case though, this was done and it wasn't being generated. It had a set string being assigned to every new account being created. That's important to remember, only new accounts. So if you created your account months or years ago, or you'd already gone and reset your password, your password wasn't being reset to this password, but if you made a new account on the affected versions, then it would be set to this password. Now for regular users like you and me, it's not really that big of a deal. Oh no, someone took over my GitLab account that has no repos on it. Oh, that's such a big deal. Doesn't really matter. But for enterprise users, it is a really big deal. Let's say you start working for a company and before you get any chance to go and reset your password, they've already made the account for you and given you access to all of the company's repos. Well, if someone finds out you have an account with that company, they know your password already and can get access to all of that code. There are certainly some questions about whether you could viably exploit that, but the fact the password is being hard coded in the first place is enough of a reason to change it. When I first heard about this, I was very confused about how this made its way into production code. When I dug more into it, I'm still very confused, but slightly less confused. So the merge request in question is this one here. JH need more complex passwords, and if you don't know, GitLab JH is the Chinese version of GitLab. I guess there are some specific requirements for that region that aren't met by the main version. So this developer's from that version and wanted to bring something useful over. There is a slight language barrier in this merge request, but I'll try to explain it the best I can. So JH need more complex password or our SaaS software as a service can never be online since the law policy of China. I guess China must have some sort of law regarding password complexity. I haven't heard about this myself. If anyone has any details about that, I would certainly love to know. And on that version, he was trying to add some password complexity validation. Basically making sure the password is strong in certain ways, has certain characters in it, has certain characters not in it, doesn't have certain strings in it, things like that. This is the result he had. 
it's not a great result. You can look up much better ways to do this, but that's the way he was trying to approach it. So over on this version, he wanted to bring basically a similar idea in and tried to update the testing suite. And in the original testing suite, it was using some really basic passwords, things like one to eight. For example, this one here, this one here, this one here, so on and so forth. In fact, there is one improvement that was made by this merge request, sticking that into a variable. If you're going to use the exact same password for every single test, why are you manually writing it out? Just stick it in a variable, so if you want to go and update it in the future and do a proper test, you can very easily do that. 1 to 8 wasn't the only basic password, there were also things like my secret or password, which if all you're doing is making sure your approval and your interface works, that's perfectly fine. If you want to do some proper password validation though, obviously you'd want to have something a bit more complex, and that's where you get passwords like this one right here. But just for the testing suite, having that password be hard-coded isn't a bad thing. In fact, in most cases, it's going to be good because you know your tests are going to be consistent. When you want to do things like testing the boundary of your password, things that might break your password system, explicitly give it data that you know is going to be a problem. You don't want to go and randomly have that data show up and get very confused by why the test is failing in this case but not in this separate case when, from what you can see, it should be the same. Now, most of this is perfectly fine. It's just updating the testing suite with all of the exact same testing password. Not really that big of a deal. It can be a little bit annoying if you had other passwords in there, maybe you were trying to test out, but perfectly fine for leaving in the code base. The issue, though, is this one right here, where an account is being created and the password being associated with that account isn't a hash of the password, but instead the default password that was being set in the testing suite. I'm not super well versed on the GitLab code base, but at least from what I can tell, this is where the problem occurred. What still confuses me though, is I have no idea how this code was merged into the code base. So apparently, Two separate people approved this. So two separate people looked at these changes. They scrolled through and were like, okay, this is changing this, changing that, changing that. They got to the bit about changing the password hash to being a default password. And like, okay, that's fine. Like, how do two separate people see that and just not think there is a problem? In what world are you setting a password to anything besides the password hash? But it is what it is, and that is what happened. I guess we just have to assume that whoever was looking over this code was just really tired or didn't really feel like examining the code properly and just let this problem slide on through, which, you know, if you're not looking at the code properly, you could probably think this is a part of the test suite still and not think too much about it. Now, the most important thing isn't that this happened, it's the follow-up. But unlike something like GitHub, where they go and push a version and then affect every single user, GitLab, you can go and self-host. So if you're using GitLab.com, the main instance of GitLab, they've already gone and updated to the patch version. And if you made an account within the past three months, you probably already been sent a password reset. If you haven't, you might as well go and reset anyway. And because this was caught relatively quickly, no accounts on their instance that they know about have been compromised. There may have been some, but at least from what they have seen, nothing has been reported. Now, if you are using a third-party instance, whether you're the admin or you're using someone else's instance, what the admin needs to do is go and run this script. Basically, it'll check when accounts were created, and if they were created within that affected time period, you can then go and send them out password resets. And just in case you need this, I'll leave this link in the description down below. This is just located on the write-up about these security patches. Now, this specific problem wasn't the only issue being addressed with these patches, but the hard-coded passwords were certainly the biggest problem that were available. At the end of the day, the important thing to remember is whenever you're working with passwords, especially if that code is going to be in a production system, make sure you're being very careful about how you're handling them. If you go and modify anything related to the authentication code or how passwords are stored or anything like that, 
make sure you go and test it, make sure you go and read it, and make sure you don't go and introduce some sort of critical vulnerability where your testing suite leaks into your production code. So any devs out there, let me know if you've done something like this. Maybe not on a production system, I hope not on a production system, but maybe in some sort of project, maybe some sort of uni project, something like that, I would love to know. And if you like this video, I'm gonna go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you wanna become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, it's only bearer pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays. That's gonna be it for me, and I'm out.